So um, this morning we talked quite a lot about compassion and its associated qualities and the importance of self-compassion to balance our own needs with the needs of others. And I saw a lovely example of this, a very simple one, but quite a touching one, when I looked in the pen over there with the rabbits and I saw four really cosy, fluffy rabbits all sitting huddled together. <laughs> and it was a very cute example of how when we're compassionate to ourselves by seeking that warmth, we also give it to the people right next to us, or the rabbits in that case. It was very cute. But um, this afternoon I wanted to look a bit more at how we can develop um, compassion in that universal way that even includes the perpetrators of harm, because that's sometimes very difficult. Sometimes um, it's easy to fall into anger and rage and although we want to act from a place of compassion to perhaps um, stop the violence, so often we act from a place of hate. And I really question whether that can work. The Buddha actually said there's never any justification for cruelty or even for punishment. So can there be another way? So I wanted to look a little bit at the obstacles that can hinder compassion. And as we said already, one of the um, obvious ones, the antithesis to compassion is actually cruelty or a desire to harm another being or even oneself. Um, and a closer enemy of compassion is this thing we know as pity. Not pity, the meditative rapture, but pity. Kind of seeing that somebody's struggling, somebody's suffering, maybe someone's lost their way, but rather than a sense of um, genuine concern for that person that widens and expands the heart, pity is a sort of looking down on another person that distances ourselves from them. You know, it's as if to say, well, poor them, it's not me. Thank goodness it's not me. But, uh, you know, they're different from me somehow. And um, I think the Buddha's understanding around causality and how basically what we think of as a kind of intrinsic person inside, like something that's stable, something that's me, is actually just a conditioned process. And this is not the end result, right? We're always changing and we're always uh, developing certain qualities and sometimes getting stuck. But as long as we're practicing, and I saw something lovely in one of the classrooms here. I, I sometimes wish I could start my education again and come to this school. <laughs> it's really nice. They had um, a growth mindset and a fixed mindset on the wall. And I thought, yeah, how many people are stuck in that fixed mindset of I cannot change? Or even others cannot change, right? People are the way they are and that's the way they'll always be. Whereas a growth mindset is like, there can be obstacles and there's a little diagram had a little figure at the top of a sort of edge. And I resonated with that. It was like leaving Perth and coming back to England, knowing nobody, because I left this country when I was 19 and suddenly finding myself at the bottom of a cliff. And in the picture, it said, number one, breathe. And there was a little step. Number two, uh, ask, oh, try, try to find a solution yourself. Step, next step. Number three, ask a friend to help, okay. And number four, ask a t actually said ask an adult. So we're supposed to be adults, I don't know. I, don't, I think we're all just grown up children really. <laughs> Again, still in a process. But this was very nice because the difference there is that, that understanding that we can change and that others can change as well. Um, another obstacle to compassion can be, and I'm sure we've all seen this in ourselves, the tendency to try and fix another person uh, sometimes to make ourselves feel better, actually, because we don't really accept the way they are, right? Or sometimes we have a very strong conditioned tendency to give and it becomes part of our identity. It's beautiful to give, it's important, right? A spiritual practice doesn't have really any depth until we start to understand the meaning of generosity and we give ourselves to service, not only practice, but serving others too without expecting anything in return. But sometimes it can become part of our um, sense of self in the sense that we're only meaningful, we only feel valued if we give. And then if somebody doesn't want to receive our giving, we actually feel a little bit dejected. 
So the, the capacity to give or the wish to give wasn't really as selfless as it seemed. And that's okay, you know, like we're not enlightened. We can't be expected to have this pure heart of giving, but just to acknowledge the obstacles that can arise when we still have, you know, pretty much a fixed sense of self and some kind of um, maladaptive patterns, right, to our stress. So we might be giving with an intention to help another person, but actually sometimes we're giving to, to make ourselves feel good. <laughs> and uh, obviously one of the main um, obstacles to the arising of compassion, maybe it's obvious, especially in terms of compassion to others, is resentment, anger, ill will, right? Which of course can lead to that cruelty, that um, desire to harm. In fact, even if it doesn't harm another person directly, it certainly harms ourselves. Um, and this can manifest as hostile thoughts towards another person or thoughts of harming, thoughts of cruelty, even just those uncharitable thoughts, you know, that sort of see a person in their worst light <laughs> and also make us pretty wound up most of the time. Uh, so, yeah, one more thing I did want to mention, because I've got a nice example of this, is um, a lack of appreciation and understanding of the struggles other people go through. And again, the Buddha talks about this as a part of right view, understanding that whatever we are now is due to all the conditioning that we've had throughout our lives, our education, the way we were raised, you know, whether we had a loving upbringing or whether we were abandoned or felt abandoned or, you know, felt we didn't fit in. Trauma, right, that can lead to addiction, that can lead to um, sometimes connecting with the wrong group of friends. Yeah. So all of these things um, create who we are, in a sense, or at least how we are today. And an example that came to mind, you know, is um, the military junta in Myanmar, because I ordained in that country, as Matt mentioned today in my life story, <laughs> which is just a story, right? Things are never quite the way they appear. But, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand how in a country like Burma, where there's so much uh, incredible Buddhist practice and you know, the monasteries are filled with people in every public holiday and it's such a virtuous land. I mean, some of the kindest, most gentle people I've ever met. And yet on the other side, there's this military regime which oppresses and um, basically slaughters its own people. And uh, it's not so much on the news, the way that, you know, the war in Palestine is or um, the Ukraine. Myanmar tends to get forgotten because it's not economically uh, interesting, perhaps, to the West. Uh, but, you know, I've lived in that country for about uh, five years or so, and it's obvious to me that one of the um, difficulties in that country is poverty, right? And the poverty means that, you know, people are, are susceptible to being called up into the military. Like they're literally recruited from poor villagers. And sometimes there's a threat there too. Sometimes there's a, a threat to their well-being or their family's well-being if they refuse to join up. So they don't have a lot of choice. And then once you join something like this, you're away from wise friendship. You're away from people who are engaged in good. And I'm not saying everybody that joins the military is necessarily perpetrating harm. You know, there are roles that are a little bit less uh, confrontational there. But still, if you're around people who feel it's a good thing to do, then you're going to get influenced by that. And uh, there have been many studies. I'm sure you've heard these studies where um, there's a researcher and they ask uh, the subjects of these studies to um, give electric shocks to somebody. Have you heard of these? I can't remember the exact details. But they tell them kind of what the range is of, that won't really hurt a person and what the range is that starts to hurt the other person. And, um, and first they ask them to give them gentle shocks, but after a while, they tell them to give stronger and stronger shocks and they're kind of forced in, they feel they're forced into it, right? And they give shocks beyond what they would ever have thought they would that actually hurt the other people. I'm not sure about the ethics of that. Maybe I've forgotten the details. Either it's something that happened a long time ago, or there was some... 
it wasn't really as high okay thanks just a response that they were told to give okay right so the people receiving the shot were acting and sort of screaming out and yet still the people who were giving the shocks didn't know that and gave much higher shocks than they would have thought they would and i think this is very humbling and of course we read this and we think but i wouldn't have done right that maybe 50 percent of them did but i would be in the other other half but how do we know if our loved ones are threatened right or if our um, basic survival needs are not met and there's a lovely um i think it's in the suttas there's a lovely story about an elephant who uh, was a very well behaved element elephant at first and he used to uh, i don't know carry the king around i guess on its back and wear all the royal finery but one day it got in with a bad crowd of elephants or a bad crowd of people i think it was yeah and uh, <laughs> it basically got in with yeah elephants are good right <laughs> so it got in with a, a bad crowd of people and those people were like bandits and thieves and they used to drink and talk about all the horrible things they were going to do the next day around the elephant and the elephant's behavior started to change it started to get very uh, uh, feisty and uh, quite wild and people wondered what was happening until they realized that they were the elephant had contact with these people even though the elephant couldn't understand the language still it picked up that negativity and became really wild so it's the same for human beings you know even though we think we like to think we're in control we're actually entirely influenced and conditioned by everything around us all the time you know it's why we come to a retreat like this hopefully because you want to be around other people who practice and sometimes people say you know that it's easier to meditate in a group because of the energy there you're not even speaking to each other but you pick up that goodness you pick up on one another's intentions right even if somebody drops something or starts to snore still it's like yeah you know I've done that before <laughs> you can give them a bit of forgiveness and uh, gosh I have a lot more to say actually it's always too much but one thing I really wanted to um, share as well is that uh, I don't know how many of you know about Kristen Neff's work with compassion, mostly probably everyone, because she sort of defined these um, aspects of compassion in a particular way. So she pointed out that compassion encompasses three things. It's basically an attitude of self-kindness as opposed to judgment, um, a focus on our common humanity rather than isolation, all things we've been discussing today and mindfulness like this capacity to stand back and be aware rather than self-identification but the bit i wanted to share about this which i find really interesting was some research that was done in the last couple of years i think and they wanted to find out whether these three factors worked in isolation so you could pick any one of them say self-compassion over judgment and work on that and whether that would increase the other two or whether they were all you know, um, separate and didn't affect each other. And what they found out, I don't know if anyone can guess, probably not. <laughs> what they found out was that when you practice common humanity over isolation and mindfulness over self-identification or over-identification, that strengthens all the others. But if you only practice self-kindness, it neither increases compassion nor strengthens the others and i just found that so interesting from a buddhist perspective because sometimes we think oh yeah self-kindness this is going to work you know it makes me feel better right but it's not enough to have that sense of concern for other and that perspective of right view so it shows me the genius of the Buddha in formulating the right view as the first factor of the path, which again emphasizes our common humanity, right? And the way that we all um, are subject to suffering. We're subject to loss. We're subject to things not going the way we wish. I don't just mean sufferings like, ah, 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 you know, terrible pain. We don't get what we want. This is very frustrating, you know, and we get separated from those we love. We get associated with the wrong people. This is all part of the Buddha's definition of suffering. 
And it's when we can tap into that with an awareness of that suffering and a desire for the release of suffering for all beings, including ourselves, that then compassion can develop in a really healthy way. And that will increase self-compassion too, because we're one among all, right? So this is a very good place to start with the practice, tapping in again and again to the fact that we're all interconnected and our actions have effects. They have effects for ourselves and also for others. We didn't come into this world alone, right? So how do we develop this compassion for the perpetrator? And I think already this has probably gone some way to help, right? Understanding that we are a subject to our conditionings, you know, the influences around us. But there are also some ways we can um, reflect to bring about a feeling of compassion as well. And one of the ways is that the Buddha told us to regard a person who's engaged in harming others as someone who's really severely sick. They're not in their right mind. Yeah. And I wanted to read a little passage from this beautiful book called Social and Communal Harmony by Bhikkhu Bodhi. The nuns are not included, but <laughs> I added them after. <laughs> And in here, he's talking about different ways to remove resentment, yeah? So this is removing the resentment in our heart. And if a person sometimes does display good qualities, he, he asks us to look at those qualities rather than only look at the faults. But then other times we find people that we just can't see any redeeming qualities in. And that becomes much harder. So the Buddha says, how friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure and who does not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind from time to time. So that means they can't calm their mind at all. They can't um, experience any inner peace, right? Then this is the analogy he gives. Suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway and the last village behind him or her or them, and the next village ahead of them were both far away. <coughs> they would not obtain suitable food and medicine or a qualified attendant, and they would not get to meet the leader or the, of the village district. Another person traveling on the highway might see them and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern for them, thinking, Oh, may this person obtain suitable food, suitable medicine, and a qualified attendant. May they get to meet the leader of the village district, who would have been the person looking out for the people in the town, in that village. For what reason? So that this person does not encounter calamity and disaster right here. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure, and they do not gain from time to time an opening of the mind, placidity of mind. On that occasion, one should arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern, thinking, oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehavior and develop good bodily behavior. May they abandon verbal misbehavior and develop good verbal behavior. May they abandon mental misbehavior and develop good mental behavior. For what reason? So that with the breakup of the body after death, they will not be reborn in a plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So I don't know if this is helpful, but I find this really beautiful, some of the language. Sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern and I think it can go further than this, you know, it's more than just that wish for them to abandon bodily, verbal and mental behavior. Although that's already a very profound wish because we're really wishing for them to abandon the causes of suffering, right? We're identifying the causes and wishing for them to abandon those. So it's not just may they feel better, but it's may they abandon the causes for their behavior, right? It's conditioned after all. But it can go even further, you know, into actually finding an attendant for that person, right? 
and sometimes uh, attendants in the in the Buddhist texts are similes for the sangha, like for a teacher, someone to show the way. You know, we can find uh, medicine for that person. Medicine means the medicine of the Dhamma, the teachings. And we can also find a doctor if we, if we possibly can, right? The doctor being the Buddha in uh, the simile of the triple gem. So, of course, when we serve and when we try to take care of others, we have to do that with, um, with a, a skillful regard for our own capacity. So we don't start to slip into kind of burnout or um, harm ourselves in some way. But um, if we find this too difficult, you know, and if we um, have done everything we can the Buddha does say that sometimes we just need to practice a bit of equanimity. Yeah, this is another way of overcoming resentment, realizing that although we really wish for this person's harm, although we do our best to see them come out of suffering to some degree, ultimately we're all the owners of our actions and we cannot control what another person does. So we try to help, we try to guide, but eventually we have to again have that perspective, be able to stand back and say, this person is going to be um, subject to the results of their own action, be it for good or for ill, right? And sometimes that is also a quality of mind that lifts us up and allows us to get enough um, peace and stability to continue to serve in ways that can help. You know, sometimes we have to actually move away from very difficult situations. For example, if you're in an abusive relationship, you know, sometimes we're told, oh, if we just try harder, you know, and that can be very harmful advice because abuse doesn't happen because there's something wrong with the person being abused. It happens because the person abusing is suffering and is perpetrating harm on another. And this doesn't say anything about you, it says more about them, right? And sometimes it's not your job to change them. You can try to get them help, you can try to get yourself some support, but sometimes you have to leave that situation. And I like that in another way the Buddha describes to overcome resentment is to ignore the person who brings up that resentment in the first place. This might seem a little bit cool or even harsh, but I find it very reassuring because again, it's trying to um, establish that balance between protecting ourselves and helping another. And sometimes even say, if you read a lot of news, you know, if you're say involved in trying to bring support to the situation in Gaza, or if you are from that place, I have a friend who's um, half Palestinian, half Jordanian, and it's very, very difficult, you know, for him to keep um, resourced in this situation. Um, I'm sure is the same. I haven't got very many close Israeli friends, but I know there are some who are very much, you know, proactive against this war. And that is really emotionally intense. <laughs> so sometimes we might have to take a break, you know, even from reading the news or from our activism work and just allow our bodies to, to restore their energy and uh, give our mind that bit of rest. And self-compassion at that time can really help. So we ignore the trigger and we work on resourcing ourselves, with the intention to come back into that situation if it's safe to do so and at a later time. But I think for, you know, abusive situations, I've had one myself and um, I never intentionally tried to send compassion and kindness to that person. I focused entirely on my own healing until the time that that compassion just arose. And that was, incredible for me to realize that, you know, the mind has wisdom, the heart has wisdom, and when it's resourced enough, it can heal. And from then on, actually, after this experience, the person like sort of popped into the heart when I was full of metta. And it had barely any, it had no impact, actually, they just joined in the flow. And from that time on, I could think about the situation, I could think about the person, without the emotional charge, without the re-traumatizing effect. And that showed me just how gentle we can be. My teacher, Ajahn Brown, calls it loving the tiger from a distance. <laughs> yeah? So you can do your work. 
to protect your mind, to protect yourself without having to necessarily go and face that tiger. Or if you do meet that tiger, make sure they're in a cage. <laughs> I don't mean prison, but you know, this is another point, right? Like what do we do with the perpetrators of harm? And is punishment ever valid or advisable? And again, I think the Buddha would probably say no, and yet there can be uh, a place for almost like quarantining someone who has an emotional or social disease. So if we see that as a sickness rather than as evil in a person, you know, if we see um, any acts of harm as indicators of a person being unwell, then we can see maybe, I don't know, reparative measures or institutions more like quarantine places that work as long as there's due care. <laughs> and I know that prisons can be very difficult places. One of my close friends uh, has a brother who's in prison and uh, he had a terrible time at first because of the people he was around. You know, you're not likely to meet wise companions or spiritual teachers usually in prison. You might, you might do. And anyone can be, you know, uh, someone to learn from. But it's quite a rough place on the whole. But eventually he joined a program that was tailored at his particular psychological issue and he got so much relief, you know, because he was actually getting some targeted care to help him come out of the causes for those offences. And then it can help. So I did want to quote a little uh, thing by Bell Hooks, who's a very wonderful um, black woman. She died. Unfortunately, I didn't get into her books until after she died. She died a couple of months ago, I think, but um, she really had a big impact on certainly the feminist movement, but I think also a lot of anti-racism work and um, just a really radical thinker who talked a lot about love and compassion. And she talked about them as actions, you know, she said, love is really a verb. It's not just a feeling, it's not a sentiment. It's something we do, it's something we cultivate in our hearts. So another way, of course, that we help others to overcome suffering is to serve, right? Without expecting anything in return. And this is what she says about service. She says, to truly serve, we must empty the ego so that space can exist to recognize the needs of others and be capable of fulfilling them. The greater our compassion, the more aware we are of ways to extend ourselves that make healing possible. And that's a, a really lovely sort of summary, isn't it, of um, the care, the egolessness, the recognition, the mindfulness that recognizes the needs of others and the awareness of how, right? The awareness of how to extend ourselves to make healing possible. And that healing is the freedom from suffering. That's what compassion is all about. So although compassion can be a challenge, uh, it is informed by wisdom every step of the way. You know, it starts from right view, this perspective on the human condition, right? Our fragility, our fallibility, the fact that we still have greed, hate and delusion like everyone else. And also how we really need one another, not only to survive, but to flourish, right? We really need one another. So our concern and compassion must extend to the societies we live in, to our families, and even to those who dropped out, so to speak, you know. And we can find ways to do this, which are within our means, within our um, capacity, being gentle with ourselves and not neglecting that self-care. Remember, self-kindness alone won't do it, but having that bigger perspective, the common humanity and the mindfulness that's aware of the suffering, but also knows how to turn towards it in a way that brings relief. Yeah. And that turning towards is always gentle, it's always uh, gradual. And we need to give ourselves and other people a lot of space, a lot of time uh, to grow. It's true that growing is possible, but it really does take time. You know, we can't just plant the seeds, no matter how perfect the soil, no matter how 
fertile it is. We can't plant seeds and just, you know, expect flowers overnight. They have to have the appropriate rain and sunshine and protection. But what we can do is hold that space. And that, in a way, is the sunshine, isn't it? It's like the light is your mindfulness and the warmth is the, the, the warmth of the sunshine. So we, we add these two elements. And then, yeah, by, by really listening to other people, again, there's something beautiful in that classroom I was in. It, it said full body listening. <laughs> Just those three words, full body listening. And I thought, yeah, we listen with our whole body, but we also listen with our hearts. We listen with our full capacity to our emotional world and learn to hold space for that. Yeah, learn to really act from a place of being embodied with that tender concern for ourselves and others to thrive. So compassion is part of the practice. It's not only the result. Right? It's part of right motivation, right speech. We try to have words that are um, kind, that are focused on the good of another person, and words that bring people together, that don't divide. There's another lovely um, description of right speech in the text, which is a little bit less known, and it is to give feedback in a way that criticizes the action, but not the person. Yeah. And the Buddha, when he criticizes even an action, he usually does so by saying, behaving in this way brings suffering, leads away from enlightenment. It's not that person did blah, 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 or even that behavior is wrong, but behaving in such and such a way will lead to harm. Behaving in another way will lead to freedom from suffering. So that was his concern. And if we can practice in this way with as much compassion as we can, then uh, it will lead to wisdom that's uh, tuned in to the needs of others, tuned in to our own needs as, as well. And that compassion becomes an expression of our wisdom, an expression of the enlightenment that we find. Yeah. So that's why the Buddha was called the Great Compassionate One and spent the rest of his life after gaining enlightenment, freedom from suffering himself and freedom from the causes, the greed, hate, delusion in his heart. He spent his whole life serving and teaching the Dhamma for the good and well-being of all living beings. And sometimes that included even giving medical attention, medical care to his disciples or making sure they were fed. So it's not only the lofty spiritual um, goal, but it's also very much grounded in you know, trying to create conditions in the world that bring about causes for beings to thrive. So however that might look for you, you know, whether you're involved in some kind of activism or anti-racism or building a monastery, it's a kind of activism, right? Trying to give opportunities for women who will feel left out if their potential, their spiritual potential is denied because some people do have a calling towards renunciation. And uh, to be told that's not possible because of your gender is extremely, uh, it's devastating, it's devastating. So um, yeah, I hope that we can all continue to practice in ways that are connected with the good of ourselves and all beings.